Sri Lankan protesters occupy the homes of the President and Prime Minister, but neither man has officially resigned. There are negotiations to form a unity government, but will they have answers to the huge economic and social problems? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the program. I'm Imran Khan. People in Sri Lanka say it's time to take back control of their country. They'd protested for months against the nation's worst economic crisis in seven decades. Many blame President Gotabaya Rajapaksa and his family for years of corruption and mismanagement. Events escalated on Saturday when demonstrators stormed the homes of the President and Prime Minister. They're refusing to leave until both men officially resign. President Rajapaksa and Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe have promised to step down, but they haven't done so. The governor of the central bank says if the political instability drags on, it could delay talks with the International Monetary Fund for a bailout. Now, we'll bring in our guests in just a moment, but first, this update from Manel Fernandez in Colombo. As you can see around me, the party atmosphere continues. I'm at the presidential secretariat, the president's office. Obviously, President Gota Rajapaksa had to move out of here about three months ago when that campaign, Gota Go Home, began continuously just outside uh, these uh, fences. And uh, just on the 9th of July, you had that big march, uh, tens of thousands of people converging on Colombo overrunning the president's official residence, also the prime minister's residence, uh, the, the burning of the prime minister's residence. Now you have a long stream of people coming in to visit all these properties. As you can see, they're taking uh, a chance to come in and see how their leaders functioned. Uh, but obviously a huge challenge ahead of Sri Lanka uh, as uh, we see this prospective changeover of power. Obviously that has to be formalized but we've got a massive economic crisis unprecedented since the uh, independence in 1948 uh, there's fuel food medicine shortages because the country has no money to buy these things the central bank governor has said that uh, there has to be political stability very quickly in order uh, to have the international community the international monetary fund with whom negotiations are taking place in order to ensure that that support comes in uh, that that must happen political stability and that is Sri Lanka's challenge right now. Minel Fernandez for Inside Story. Now the Rajapaksa family has been in politics since the 1930s. Mahinda Rajapaksa first became president in 2005. He appointed his brother Gotabaya as defense secretary and placed other family members in senior positions. Gotabaya won the presidency in 2019 and appointed his brother Mahinda as Prime Minister a year later. It's believed the brothers control up to 70% of Sri Lanka's budget at one point. The family denies this. But inflation has now hit 55% and could rise to 70% in a few months. And the government's run out of foreign reserves to buy fuel and medicine. Let's bring in our guests. They're all joining us from Sri Lanka's capital, Colombo. Nishan Dimel is an economist and executive director of Verite Research. Ganeshan Vignaraja is a senior research associate for the Overseas Development Institute, ODI Global. And Virakon Vijay Wardena is a former deputy governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka and a columnist for the Daily Financial Times. A warm welcome to you all. I'd like to start with uh, Ganeshan. Ganeshan, we, here we are. We have a situation where the Prime Minister and the President are, have disappeared, effectively. We don't know where they are exactly. Uh, they have said they're going to resign, but under the Sri Lanka's constitution, they can't resign until they give a letter to the Speaker of the Parliament. So, effectively, they're still in charge. Are they banking on the fact that these, pro these protests may well dissipate and they can remain in charge? I, I don't think so. I think we have now a process where these leaders are exiting the scene and we will have a new government, an interim government that should be formed hopefully on the 20th of this month. And that will be a president hopefully coming through election from parliament and then some sort of interim cabinet. My hope is that this is a very slim down cabinet 
that will stay in power for a limited period after which we will have some elections and a new mandate for a government for a longish period. In the interim, this interim government must continue with the IMF program, which is essential for Sri Lanka to come out of this crisis and ensure that we have a proper democratic transition with a respect for the rule of law. Well, let me bring in now uh, Vera Khan. Uh, Vera, this um, is something that Sri Lankans have been worried about for many decades now, this idea of corruption, this idea of financial mismanagement. Are the chickens coming home to roost effectively? Or was this always on the cards? Yeah, I think uh, the present situation in Sri Lanka, as Ganeshan had just described, is a very pathetic and acute situation. And uh, all we will have to look for is uh, restoring normals to Sri Lanka. And that would be a gigantic task for the new interim government that is to be formed, uh, because they will have to start, I think, from uh, scratch, uh, from, from a scratch level. And as a result, uh, the, uh, the, the, the expectations of the people are so huge in the country, uh, they may not be able to meet those expectations. And I think they should have a, a pre clearly pre-announced plan, announcing a timeline for people to understand at which level, at what uh, what uh, kind of uh, uh, delivery would be made by the new interim government, so that uh, there must be a necessity for the new interim government to have a continuous dialogue with the people of the country and also keep them into confidence when the new government uh, plans anything. So this is the gigantic task which uh, the new interim government will have to fulfill in Sri Lanka within the next six months time period until the country is suitable uh, for conducting another election to enable the people to elect their own government. Nishan Demil, uh, what Vera Khan is talking about there seems to be managing expectations. Often when we have protest movements, it doesn't matter where they are in the world, the protesters expect a magic bullet and for everything to change overnight. That never happens. So managing expectations is absolutely crucial. But what are the challenges for this incoming government? So two things I think are quite critical, Imran. Thank you for bringing us in. One is, of course, dealing with the immediate shortages of fuel uh, and the power cuts that are in the country that's really causing difficulty for people's lives. And I think the failure in the current government is not only that there isn't adequate supply, but there isn't adequate belief that the available supplies are being given out in a rational or uncorrupt manner. So simply managing it well and telling people the truth and setting proper systems of distribution is already going to be an improvement. The second most important challenge, I think, is to deal with the deepening poverty. We expect poverty in Sri Lanka to rise above 50% by the end of the year. And it is imperative that Sri Lanka look at cash transfers for the poor and find mechanisms to target uh, the poor properly. We think that looking at electricity consumption is a great way to do that, and the technology is available to directly deliver support to people. And these are solutions that are available. And I think the current government's uh, sense of mismanagement and corruption was preventing even possible solutions from not being implemented at the, at the proper time. And a change in government will build a kind of credibility and hopefully a little more competence uh, to, to help Sri Lanka move in the right direction, even though the results are still slow and long time coming. Uh, Ganeshan, uh, what we're talking about now then seems to be this idea that there are, there are concrete steps you can take, this idea of managing expectations, communicating with the country and having some easy fixes. But there is a fly in the ointment. We have these talks going out with the International Monetary Fund right now. Uh, whenever the International Monetary Fund get involved or the World Bank get involved in a crisis, they often introduce austerity measures which actually impact the most poor of that country. And again, the anger rises. Where does the IMF fit into all of this? So essentially, the IMF team was here a couple of weeks ago and have left, and a staff-level program is to be worked out. We understand that some of the details of this program are to have tax rises across the board, 
Uh, secondly, to make sure that the interest rates are much more realistic, which means upward pressure on interest rates to try to reduce inflation. And a third measure is anti-corruption measures to ensure that the administration works better and state-owned enterprises are more accountable. Now, one very important aspect of this IMF program is that they're not trying to tinker too much with state expenditure, which will stay at quite a reasonable level, thus ensuring that the anti-poverty program that the country has uh, will be maintained. Uh, it's not a perfect program, the sum of the program, but uh, can deliver some relief to the poor. On top of that, we have to have what Nishan was talking about, which is um, what they call conditional cash transfers uh, to the poorest people. And that should come through with some assistance from other multilateral donors. Now, I believe that it is hard to target this kind of program on the poorest because our targeting mechanisms aren't perhaps so uh, well developed. And uh, so if we do these things right and gradually get the economy on some stable footing, some kind of return to growth may occur. This year we will have negative growth, which will be a terrible phenomenon for us. But hopefully next year and the year after we'll have some kind of growth. And growth is a very powerful mechanism for this country to gradually create the jobs it needs for its youth and also gradually create some kind of return slowly to a, a sort of a prosperous country. And I, I think this is doable if we do the right things right now. Now, of course, political will is essential, mm. and this new government will have huge expectations upon it. Uh, this government will have huge expectations upon it. That's quite a strong statement there from uh, uh, Ganesh. Uh, let's just talk to Vera Khan uh, at the moment. Often when the IMF get involved, and this is a question I do want to ask you uh, because you were the deputy governor of the central bank, uh, austerity measures are brought in. We're talking about tax rises there uh, and things of that nature. It's often the middle class that get hit uh, with those things. Uh, Sri Lanka's middle class is already under attack and has been for so, you know, several years now because of uh, the corruption in the country. How much of this is going to impact them and how much of this is going to be unpopular amongst voters? Well, of course, not only the middle class of the country. The people of all income levels in Sri Lanka would be affected by the uh, new uh, posterity program which IMF is planning to implement in Sri Lanka. As a result, as I have mentioned earlier, it is necessary for the new government to uh, communicate with the people the correct position, get their views at every stage of the new uh, measures that they are going to implement, and for that purpose, they have to get their support. For example, now, the one of the requirements of the IMF is this uh, debt restructuring, which has to be a uh, precondition for the IMF bailout. But in addition to that, there are many other uh, requirements which the IMF has insisted on. Uh, one important thing is that the government should consolidate its budget, which means that the budget deficit will be brought to an affordable level by increasing the revenue as well as cutting down the expenditure, except what is meant for the poor people. Now, in this case, the new government that is to be formed uh, after 20 years, hopefully, uh, will have a gigantic task because our treasury is is empty, not only actually it is empty, it is negative. For example, mm. in terms of the constitution of Sri Lanka, uh, we have a consolidated fund into which all the monies of the government would uh, be, be credited and all expenses will have to be done by debiting that particular consolidated fund. That particular consolidated fund is negative, it is overdrawn to the extent of uh, nearly 2 billion Sri Lanka rupees. In addition to that, uh, there is again uh, nearly 1, billion, 1 trillion Sri Lanka rupees uh, has to be, uh, had been overdrawn by the government by way of overdraft from the two state banks mm. and the central bank. Right. So altogether, the government finances are in fact negative and the, the new government will have to start from the negative position and convert it to a positive position and which is the biggest task that they have to accomplish during their uh, period. I have to say, all three of you sound like you're very realistic about what the future holds, but you also seem to be quite help, uh, hopeful. If, you know, the government can manage expectations, if it communicates, if it takes certain measures, then perhaps this is a crisis that the government can get itself out of, the new incoming government can get itself out of. But I want to talk about the old government, Nishanda Mill. How did the Rajapaksas manage to mess up what was quite a strong 
economy so spectacularly? So I think um, what we can see uh, and learn from Sri Lanka's experience is that a few wrong moves unchecked uh, can lead a country into very dangerous, irrevocably downward spirals in terms of its economics. Take one example. Uh, the president banned chemical fertilizer overnight and claimed that he was going to make agriculture based exclusively on organic, on organic fertilizer in one year. That was a crazy policy by any account. And I think the unaccountability of the president that he ruled as if he was running an authoritarian state allowed him to take, make very bad policies and prevent the democratic mechanisms to correct them. We know that you know, one of the things that democracies are good at is preventing extremely bad policies. That's why famines never occur in democracies. Uh, and I think the unchecked bad decision-making on tax cuts, on continuing to pay creditors while reserves were going to zero, on banning chemical fertilizer and destroying productivity in the agriculture sector, all these things compounded uh, to bring Sri Lanka into this disastrous economic state that it is now. And undergirding that is corruption. Mm. Uh, one of the things we must ask of the IMF is that uh, it is macro-critical uh, to deal with corruption if you want to fix the Sri Lankan economy or we will be back where we are in a few years' time. Uh, the Attorney General proved unreliable and in political capture by reversing much of the indictments against politicians that were already in court. Mm. So we need an independent corruption prosecuting office. Asset declarations cannot be secret. The IMF in many countries has asked for them to be transparent as a condition of its support. And Sri Lanka will need, and this is the last thing I'll say, an anti-corruption office that is supported by an external agency such as the United Nations, because Sri Lankan politicians on both sides have so far proved unreliable when it comes to taking action on corruption. And taking action on corruption is a fundamental part of the fix for the Sri Lankan economy going forward. Uh, Ganeshan, seeing the Rajapaksas in the dock, seeing this anti-corruption courts take place, people held accountable, court cases happen, is that a dream? Do you think that can happen? No, I don't think so. I think it's possible to change institutions and structures, as we have seen in other parts of East Asia. On this uh, issue of foreign aid and assistance that we are going to get, both humanitarian and IMF, we have to make sure we do two things to ensure that this is properly effective. The first is we must make sure that all of this aid goes right throughout the country, that it goes right from Jaffna to the East Coast, to the Deep South, to the central part of Sri Lanka. It shouldn't just be provided to Colombo and Gampaha, which is the central uh, part of the country with the economic center. The second very important thing, as Nishan has said, is that the aid should be fully accounted for. Every dollar that is given to Sri Lanka should be properly accounted for and looked after. And there should be very, very low admin uh, overhead on that money. And certainly the siphoning off, uh, which had occurred in the past, should be very carefully checked. The risk, if we do not do this properly, is that countries where taxpayers are providing money for Sri Lanka will get fed up with us and they will not be so generous. And that will be a humanitarian disaster for Sri Lanka and the people of Sri Lanka. So one expects this new government to have very, very strong anti-corruption policy and be very honest with the people about how it's spending foreign aid, not just for the people of Sri Lanka, but also for foreigners whose taxpayers are uh, providing funds for Sri Lanka to rescue it from this calamity that we ourselves have brought upon us, at least partly. Uh, Vido Korn, we're talking now about a strong anti-corruption policy. Surely a part of that is holding the people who were corrupt to account, putting the Rajapaksas on trial. Do you think that could ever happen? Well, of course, you know, there is another dimension now which has just uh, emerged uh, for the IMF bailout package. The U.S. Foreign Relations Committee in a Twitter message about a week ago had announced that there are three other conditions should be satisfied by Sri Lanka to get this IMF bailout package. One is the central bank should be made independent. Number two is what uh, both Ganeshan and Nissan 
has been uh, explained to us now. Second one is the uh, the uh, there should be rule of law, observance of the rule of law. Third one is there must be an effective anti-corruption program uh, to be implemented by Sri Lanka in order to qualify for the IMF bailout package. So what it means is that the new government has no choice now. Whatever the difficulties that they have, they will have to have a very quick and fast uh, legal reform. As uh, Nishanta had said, the Attorney General had been captured by the uh, politicians in the past, that uh, Attorney General should be freed. At the same time, the law enforcement agency should be freed. And the uh, anti-corruption body that we have already set up had been, uh, its powers have been diluted by the 20th Amendment to the Constitution, which Gotabi Rajpaksa had implemented. So all these things will have to be reversed very quickly in order to enable Sri Lanka to satisfy the donors. Because uh, Ganeshan has very correctly said that in addition to the IEF money, we need this humanitarian aid also mm, as right. quickly as possible. If these, if these things are, are not done, I don't think the humanitarian aid would flow into Sri Lanka. Nishan, I've covered the Middle East and South Asia for many, many, many years. I've seen what the IMF can do when they do come into a country. Uh, they come in with ev everything that you guys have just said. They come in with austerity measures, anti-corruption measures, the promise of a lot of money coming in, and then they are faced with a government that simply doesn't change. Now, your thesis seems to be that this next incoming government, although it has a challenge on its hands, can change. But there's a lot of people that are looking at Sri Lanka now going, it's still a lot of the same faces that will be in charge. Can this government change? Thank you, Imran. Um, it is a, a very serious concern that Sri Lankans don't trust most parliamentarians. And I think for the sake of the credibility of government, it's not enough for the government to change leadership and hands today. We need an election and we need it as fast as possible. It is only a newly elected government in which new people who are part of the protest can also compete and come into parliament that will finally have adequate legitimacy in Sri Lanka to drive the reforms as well as the measures that are needed for economic recovery going forward. I think that the culture of our politics which has been seeped in corruption and incompetence is what young people have decried today. Mm. And they need a chance uh, to exercise their vote to say and say, we want something different. And, and that is the cry of the people, which I think has to be heeded as soon as possible. Ganesh, there is the argument to be made that Sri Lanka is a robust democracy. It does have democratic procedures and institutions in place. Is it robust enough to do what the three of you are saying needs to be done? I think my sense is that we have to at least try to try to create a new beginning for Sri Lanka. And I personally see Sri Lanka as a kind of a post-conflict state, which is still having the legacy of a long 30-year-old conflict and its institutions have been affected by this long conflict. And we are now trying to rebuild uh, going forward. And in that process, we're going to have to do something very rapidly. You know, one of the really terrible things that I'm seeing is these long queues at the passport office where the young people of Sri Lanka want to leave. I mean, there are those protesting, but most of the skilled are leaving. And that's a terrible tragedy for a country that has an aging society. And if this continues, we will be much poorer in the future. So I think there's no choice but for us to actually begin to reinvent. And I think we need to have a smaller government in the future, a government that's much more capable of delivering public services, providing a rule of law and proper macroeconomic management. And the private sector will have to also play a much more responsible role going forward. And there'll have to be a lot of emphasis on corporate governments and corporate social responsibility. So I think we need to begin to think about a new social contract uh, and also enforcing the democratic principles that we want. And we have to avoid capture, either mm. crony capitalism or yep. uh, governmental capture in the way that we've had in this last uh, period with the Rajapaksa family basically uh, ruling the roost. I want to thank all our guests, Nishan Dimel, Ganesh Vignaraja and Virakun Vijay Wardena. And thank you too for watching. Now, you can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the entire team here in Doha, bye for now.